are listening to The Alzheimer's Podcast with Mike Good of Togetherness, your number one resource for practical tips and insights, empowering you and your family to live well with Alzheimer's. Hello and welcome to episode one of The Alzheimer's Podcast. I'm Mike Good. I couldn't be more excited to have you here for the launch of this podcast, where my goal will be to empower you to maintain a positive experience, reduce and eliminate the need for medications, and make your time together with those you care for the best it can be. Overall, I want to help you and your family live well, or live the best you can with Alzheimer's or other dementia in your life. Therefore, in this inaugural episode, I'll be discussing what it means and takes to live well with Alzheimer's. The information is derived from one of my signature presentations that I've given multiple times in my own community. A lot of what I'm going to discuss is derived from what I've learned directly from people who are living positive lives despite having Alzheimer's. Some I've personally interviewed, and you can find those interviews on togetherinthis.com forward slash PWD interview, where PWD stands for Person with Dementia. I also include a link in the show notes. I've also been involved with caregivers for several years now, and I've seen and heard what works and what doesn't. You must remember and accept what works for one family may not work for you. And what results in success may change from day to day, if not hour to hour. And when you ask people what living well means to them, you will get an array of answers. For some, it's about being happy. For others, it's about their health. For the person with dementia, this often means wanting to do the things they've always done, or spending quality time with family and friends. They don't want to be judged by others. They don't want to lose cherished memories. And they don't want to be a burden to anyone. And they want to maintain their dignity throughout the disease. For their caregivers and extended family, it often means knowing that their loved one is safe, keeping them happy, maintaining their health, helping them maintain dignity. And most won't admit this, and it's completely acceptable but they also want to minimize the impact on their own life. But for the family faced with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia, it also takes on a whole new meaning because living well is also vital to protecting the health and well-being of both care partners. Now throughout my discussions and all upcoming podcasts, when you hear me say care partners, please understand that I'm talking about the person with dementia and you the caregiver. Now, Living well is the best medicine for delaying the progression of the disease. And yes, I believe the elements of living well, when implemented on a daily basis, are your best weapon in delaying the progression. Today I'm going to discuss eight pillars of care that must be addressed in order for both the person with Alzheimer's and their family, including you, to live well through the stages of the disease. I say family because it's the entire family who is affected by the disease and it requires a team effort implementing different strategies based on the person's abilities and needs throughout the stages of the disease. Because you as the primary care partner will be at the center of care for your parent or spouse throughout the disease progression, your health and well-being will also erode if left unchecked. Therefore, a family's care strategy must not only include the person with Alzheimer's, but also you, the primary care partner, and anyone else actively involved in providing care. The first pillar I'm going to discuss are emotions. The emotional roller coaster leaves the station the first time something's considered to be wrong. Now, generally, the first emotions are fear and worry. I hear people say that a diagnosis temporarily relieves the fear, but it kicks off a wave of emotions that will continue throughout the disease progression and beyond for family and friends. Living well requires the care partners to accept and learn to manage their emotions. 
Now by no means am I implying that this is going to be easy, because it won't be, but awareness is key. The person with dementia may feel fear about what it will do to their family, angry that they have a debilitating disease, embarrassed about what others may think, and frustration about losing abilities. You, as the caregiver, will also feel fear and you will likely feel every emotion at some point, including sadness, happiness, anxiety, anger, and guilt is a big one. Now, too often depression and fear take hold and the care partners withdraw from family, friends, society. Again, I'm talking about both the person with dementia and you, the caregiver. Both of you are at high risk for social and emotional isolation. Isolation accelerates the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Once a person becomes cut off, they start to lose their sense of purpose. And having purpose is critical to living well, whether it's family, friends, a cause such as making dinner, or a hobby. This purpose is why we get up in the morning. The first major hurdle to living well is reaching acceptance, where you and your loved one accept that they have a disease, which is no different than diabetes or breast cancer, for instance. My online friend Harry has been living well with Alzheimer's for more than a decade, and he said, to live a happy life, you need to accept your disease and convince yourself that there is life beyond your diagnosis. You too, as their caregiver, must accept that you can't fix things and that things will never be the same. I realize this sounds harsh, but the sooner acceptance is reached, the sooner the two of you can live better, if not well, with Alzheimer's. You will feel more comfortable sharing with family and friends, and as a result, these friends often rally behind the two of you. And this will help you maintain the social aspect of living well. In one of my interviews that I mentioned earlier, Lori Scherer talks about how her friends rallied behind her to have a successful scuba diving trip. And I still see posts from her that demonstrates how her family continually supports her to live, as she says, positively with Alzheimer's. Even with acceptance and support, the emotional roller coaster will continue for both of you. There will be good days and bad days. And it's okay to have a good cry and a yell into a pillow. In fact, it's recommended. Now, if you want to know more about the emotions, I'll provide a link in the show notes to an article I've written. Pillar 2 of Living Well is about protecting choices and dignity. The ability to make decisions and choices is important to a person's individualism. Once you've reached acceptance, you now understand that a day will come when your loved one won't be able to make choices on their own. But planning for the future will help protect their long-term wishes. You must accomplish this by getting important documents in order. This will give both of you peace of mind knowing that all legal, financial, and medical situations will be properly handled when the need arises. In the early to mid stages, your loved one will be aware of what they want but maybe the words don't come as quickly or they struggle to follow conversations. You must adapt to their ability so you can respect and document their choices. As the disease progresses, you must continue to help them maintain independence and confidence. Often you will accomplish this by silently assisting them. For instance, if they are looking for something, you don't tell them, it's in the cabinet where it's always been. You take it from the cabinet and put it in front of them where they will see it without pointing out their inability to do it themselves. This is silent assistance. Remember, as Dr. Jennifer Butte, who's living with Alzheimer's, says, do more with us and less for us. We want to empower people to be successful in making their choices. Help them make these choices. For instance, don't pick out their clothes. Give them options to choose from. And always remember to treat them like an adult. Watch your use of terms of endearment such as sweetie, unless you've always called them sweetie. And always refrain from using baby terms. Respect their privacy 
and always include them in conversations. Pillar number three of living well is socialization. As I mentioned, there's a lot of ignorance and misunderstanding about Alzheimer's in our society. Because of this, families dealing with dementia often stay in the closet. This is very similar to what occurred in the past when a person was diagnosed with cancer or HIV. David Kramer, who's another online friend of mine who's living well with Alzheimer's, he said, There are still a tremendous number of people with dementia who are closeted. They are afraid of losing their friends, losing their jobs. And I would add that it's probably the vast majority of people. They withdraw from family, friends, and society. And as I mentioned, isolation is a catalyst that increases the rate of decline. And all too often, caregivers become trapped in their own homes, and this quickly erodes their mental and physical well-being. It's vital that you maintain social circles for both you and your loved one. You must force yourself to get out of the house no matter how difficult it is. This is one reason why a team approach is needed. New faces, new interactions are all healthy for you and your loved one. Plus, these additional care partners can spend time with your loved one as you get away and enjoy some me time. When having social interactions with your loved one, remember to keep group sizes smaller, remove distractions, and have the ability for them to slip away for some peace and quiet. Sometimes you will need to educate or remind people about how Alzheimer's affects a person's ability to process and filter sensory input. Reminding and educating them can help family and friends show more empathy. Pillar number four of living well is intellectual stimulation. We all want an easy solution, so we hope that we can protect our brain by simply doing more crossword puzzles or playing some Sudoku, but it's much more complex than that. The brain, much like our muscles, needs to be exercised. Just like the amount of weight and intensity of your workout affects your results, the same is true about how you work your brain. Crossword puzzles, brain games, and hobbies might be an important part of your happiness, but these activities don't likely carry enough weight to improve you or your loved one's brain health. But there is good news. Researchers have proven that even the brain of an older adult can reorganize itself by forming new neural connections. But it just makes sense that in order for this to occur, you must push your intellectual limits. Learn new things that challenge you on a recurring basis. This is one reason I know of people who have dementia who are learning sign language or second language. And if you can include purpose with the learning, maybe setting goals to share what you learn with others, or if you learn a new hobby, share the end product with somebody. It's this combination which is the most powerful in forming these new neural connections. The people I know who are living well despite their Alzheimer's have created and maintained websites or Facebook groups. Some advocate for better Alzheimer's care, and others even teach newly diagnosed how to fight back against dementia. Some other ideas may include writing life stories, creating photo albums, developing a family tree, volunteering, etc. As the disease progresses, you must remember to focus on abilities and not shortcomings. If they can no longer pay bills, let them sort the mail or assist you. If they can't cook alone, let them help you prepare the meal. But no matter what, keep them involved. And don't forget about yourself. You need intellectual stimulation as well. Nutrition is pillar five of living well with Alzheimer's. Following good dietary guidelines are still as important, and a heart-healthy diet and a rainbow of fruits and vegetables are a must. In the early to mid stages of the disease, your loved one will still be able to eat and drink on their own. But you may want to start introducing easy to prepare or pre-made foods. As the disease progresses, they may start to lose interest and the ability to properly eat and drink. You as the caregiver must be the provider, and for some of you this may be a new role. But you must establish a system to provide them, as well as yourself, with the proper dietary intake. Try to maintain mealtime routines, including times, location, and process. Consider using finger food and high-calorie foods, 
and protein shakes when needed. Later in the disease, they may start to have chewing and swallowing problems. At this point, you may need to provide small pieces, pureed foods, or soft foods such as ice cream, yogurt, and soups. And yes, it's okay to have the occasional ice cream and or hamburger. We got to have some fun too, right? So hydration is also critical. And many foods are good at helping. Foods such as celery, cantaloupe, tomatoes, and other fruits and vegetables are high in water content. Mealtime is such an important part of our lives. You must do everything you can to preserve it and maximize its benefits. Not only is nutrition and hydration an important part, but there's a social aspect as well. Check out the show notes at togetherinthis.com forward slash episode one for additional resources on this element of living well. Exercise and movement is pillar six of living well. All our lives we've been told about exercise guidelines, and much like nutrition, these guidelines are still just as important. Sound health is dependent upon the functioning and interaction of our neurophysiologic systems. These include our circulatory, respiratory, digestive, muscular, and neurological systems, and these systems are stimulated as we move and exercise. Also, cells within the body, including your brain, need proper amounts of oxygen and the nutrition we talked about to stay healthy. And exercise helps spread oxygen and nutrients throughout the body while also flushing out waste. If possible, there should be a focus on balance, since risk of falls increases substantially as we age, and even more when the person has Alzheimer's and or is on additional medications. Like mealtime, exercise is a great opportunity to do things together. Going for walks, dancing, some Tai Chi or yoga. I even know a couple who still plays tennis together. Housework can also be a form of exercise. And it creates purpose and it can be done together. Be sure to include arm and leg movements. Use balloons, light weights, or stretch bands when applicable. My friend Lori Scherer that I mentioned earlier said, since I started a regular exercise routine, I feel better physically and mentally, and I do not seem to have any more of those dementia days as I used to. I think I need to write a blog about how much better I feel since getting into an exercise routine. It really makes a huge difference. And there's scientific evidence now that shows that exercise and living well can possibly slow the decline of Alzheimer's. A lack of activity can result in daytime sleeping and nighttime restlessness, so you want to make sure to keep up some activities even if mobility becomes an issue. Exercise should include getting outdoors, so this is also a good time to introduce an ID bracelet or maybe even consider getting a tracking device, just in case they do become separated from you. Make sure to listen to episode 2 where I discuss the right of people with dementia to go outdoors on a regular basis. Pillar 7 of living well is all about your home environment. We spend the vast majority of our lives in our homes, yet the vast majority of families dealing with Alzheimer's do very little to make their home Alzheimer's friendly. In order for your home to be friendly, you must focus on improving and maintaining four elements. The first element is safety. A safe home will help keep your loved one independent while helping them maintain their individualism. You will also have greater peace of mind knowing they are safe. Element two is function. Function is possibly the most overlooked of the four elements in an Alzheimer's friendly home. Function is the ability of the home to meet the needs of its occupants. With function, the home works for you and your loved one will be empowered to safely complete tasks on their own with minimal assistance. Non-functional elements put the resident in danger or hinders their ability to perform a task or activity. This can result in injury and negative emotions. We want to turn potentially negative outcomes into successful outcomes. Stimulation is element three of the Alzheimer's friendly home. Stimulation keeps everyone mentally and physically active and brings joy, lifts one's spirit, and results in feelings of further purpose and accomplishment. These first three elements all work together to reduce negative triggers. 
Reducing negative triggers is the fourth element of an Alzheimer's friendly home. A trigger is something such as an action, event, or stimuli that initiates or precipitates a reaction or series of reactions. In our loved one with dementia, the home environment often triggers behaviors we would rather avoid, such as anger and aggression, or exiting a home and becoming lost. I have an entire course on these four elements called Adapting Your Home for Dementia. I'll include a link in the show notes as well. Our eighth and final element of living well with Alzheimer's involves meeting the spiritual needs of your loved one and yourself. While we tend to think of spiritual needs as religion, it can be any kind of meaningful activity or blissful experience, such as being around grandchildren, gardening, hobbies, meditation, tai chi, or even taking long walks. I know I find gardening or a long walk in the wood to touch my soul at times. Religion can include worship, readings, music, prayer, or holiday rituals. If they can still attend services, this is a great opportunity to get out of the house and into a loving and social environment. If not, maybe watching a service on TV would be enjoyed. For many of us, music related to our religion or holidays can stir our spirits and bring back many fond memories. If they've celebrated certain holidays, don't hesitate to extend the celebrations a few extra days or weeks. And as the caregiver, it's important that you too fulfill your spiritual needs. Tied to spirituality is faith and hope. This can help you cope better as a caregiver. So that wraps up our eight elements of living well with Alzheimer's. Today we discussed what it means and takes to live well with Alzheimer's. It won't be easy and it takes daily proactive effort. But together, we can implement these strategies to help you, your loved one, and the rest of your family live well with Alzheimer's. I couldn't go into great detail due to time constraints, but future episodes will dive deeper into what it takes to live well with Alzheimer's. Be sure to head over to the show notes and get all the reference resources at togetherinthis.com forward slash episode one. And I can't wait to talk with you in the next episode where I'll discuss the right of people with dementia to go outdoors. All right, bye now. See you soon. You've been listening to The Alzheimer's Podcast with Mike Good of Togetherness. For more information and to get the resources mentioned in this episode, visit togetherinthis.com forward slash podcast.